Welcome to Buried Secrets, a podcast about the paranormal, the occult, and weird and forgotten history. I'm Chris. So for anyone keeping score at home, this is the 10th episode in my series about the history and hauntings of Fordham University here in New York City, in the Bronx. I can say with near certainty that this series will wrap up after next episode. So after the 11th episode in my look at Fordham's history and hauntings. Whether you're just jumping in with this episode or whether you've been listening to the whole series, thank you for joining me. So because I'm kind of wrapping up my look at this weirdness that is reported to have taken place at Fordham University, I want to look at theories behind what makes a place haunted. So this episode, I want to focus mostly on urban legends, ley lines. I want to look at some other colleges and try to compare and contrast their numbers of hauntings with Fordham's numbers of hauntings. And then next time, I want to talk about the theories of window areas, liminal spaces or portals, strong emotions as a focal point for hauntings, intelligent versus residual hauntings, tulpas, egregores, exorcisms, as well as bad things that may have happened on campus that might have an effect on the different hauntings and urban legends, etc. If you're skeptical about whether or not I can fit all of that into one episode next time, so am I. We'll see. But I have the script written for next time, so I think I'll be able to make it all fit in. We'll see. So like I said, I'm really trying to answer the question, what makes a place haunted? And specifically, why might Fordham be so haunted? I'm also trying to answer the question, you know, why are some places more haunted than others? What causes hauntings? Or if, you know, there aren't hauntings, but there's legends of hauntings, what causes those urban legends about hauntings? Because, you know, those questions also tie into all my questions about Fordham and everything I've been looking at in this series. So this is a huge topic that I know it's impossible to cover in just a couple episodes. So this will be kind of a lightning round of different theories about hauntings and the paranormal. These questions about what makes a particular place particularly haunted is one that a lot of people have explored in a lot of different really interesting ways. And there are, of course, a number of podcasts that do deep dives into this exact topic and looking at why a certain area might have strange stuff associated with it. For example, if you don't listen to it already, there's a really great and very popular podcast called Penny Royal that looks at the town and the area around Somerset, Kentucky, and really dives deep into the history and lore and legends and paranormal happenings, etc. in that town in that area. So if you're interested in the subject and you haven't already listened to Penny Royal, you should definitely check that out as well, because that goes way, way deeper into this sort of thing than I have time to go into here. But I want to at least scrape the surface of the subject, so let's get into it. So first off, there's a clarification that I wanted to give. Throughout this series, I think I've probably fallen into the trap of talking about paranormal phenomena as if everything is a ghost and as if every ghost is the spirit of a dead person. That is in part because that's what a lot of the urban legends about Fordham University have posited. And probably I've been falling into that verbal trap because it's related to, you know, the less complex ideas that I had about the paranormal while I was in school. And also because when looking at urban legends and trying to analyze them basically just from, you know, my own experiences and stories that I've found in articles, etc., it can be a little difficult to know what to look into aside from the history of the people who lived in that location and the location's past. Because, you know, you only have so many records at your disposal and I'm not going there and doing my own paranormal investigations. So I really have been kind of restricted to the information I've been able to gather through, you know, the written record and my memory, etc. But I just wanted to be completely clear here and say that I don't think that all paranormal phenomena are ghosts. And I tend to be of the opinion that 
all paranormal stuff, whether it's apparently ghostly experiences or UFO encounters or cryptid sightings, etc. I think they're all connected somehow and potentially part of the same phenomena. So that's just something to keep in mind. And that's something I'll try to explore a little bit more in these next two episodes. The other thing I wanted to mention is that, so I started publishing this series in October 2021. It is now February 2022. And I did most of the Fordham related research for this series back in late 2020, actually. So I've been researching this series for a while and thinking about it for a while. But since starting to publish this series, so since last October, I've been delving more into what I guess you'd call theory, like theory behind haunted location. So looking at stuff like folklore, urban legends, psychogeography, and hauntology, and trying to get some additional angles through which to see these phenomena that I've been looking at. And though I haven't necessarily been talking about these books, I did want to mention them because one, I believe they're of interest, and two, they have helped me contextualize and think about a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about throughout this series. So the specific books that I wanted to mention that I've read since October are Magic in the Landscape, Earth Mysteries and Geomancy by Nigel Pinnock. I read this because I was interested in ley lines. I had this thought in October, which was, could Fordham possibly lie on a ley line? So that question led me to read more about the subject. I felt like this book was a good intro to the topic. Then I read Psychogeography by Merlin Coverley. I read the 2006 version of that book and then realized afterwards that there was a revised version that was published, I think, in 2018 or something. So, you know, if you read that, maybe check out the newer one. I also read Hauntology, Ghosts of Futures Past by Merlin Coverley, which was published in 2020. So in my opinion, both of these Merlin Coverley books were very good and interesting, though please don't ask me to give a good definition of what psychogeography or hauntology are. I think they're better known concepts in the UK, but it also sounds like they sort of mean a lot of things and nothing at once. So if you want a little behind the scenes thing, I was reading through my notes just now and I was gonna say, you know, if I were to give my best and probably very incorrect or at least incomplete definition, and then I was I went to write down my my definition and I got as far as psychogeography is about <laughs> is about place. Somehow when I was rereading my notes before recording this, I completely missed that I just didn't put definitions in here. So let me give you my attempt at a definition right off the top of my head. So psychogeography is a lot about people's interaction with place, and it seems to often be linked to people exploring and, let's say, enjoying walking around in urban environments, though it's not exclusively about urban environments. And it has aspects that are occult, that are literary, and that are political. And it sort of has its original roots in some leftist political philosophies, but now seems to be not completely meaningless, but difficult to pin down. And hauntology, on the other hand, has a lot to do with ideas about the return of the past and perhaps even this idea of being haunted by the past. And it certainly can be tied in with occult and paranormal concepts, though it doesn't necessarily have to. I feel like I learned a lot in reading these two books. Just I didn't really learn what the terms psychogeography and hauntology necessarily mean. But that's what I've got for those definitions. And I really do think they're enjoyable books if you're interested in this sort of thing. I also read a book called The Official Guide to Randonautica, Everything You Need to Know About Creating Your Random Adventure Story by Joshua Linkfelder and Auburn Salcedo, which was published in 2021. And I should do an episode about Randonautica sometime and some of the randonauting that I've done. But I read this book because randonauting is a form of psychogeography. And if that sentence made no sense to you, don't worry. I'll explain Randonautica in a future episode, 
But I will say that book was helpful in thinking about the ways in which you might explore your environment and your surroundings on both a physical, but also maybe like a metaphysical level. I also read a excellent book called On Trails and Exploration by Robert Moore, which was published in 2017. I think it was a New York Times bestseller. Like it's a big book published by a major publishing house written for a wide audience. And it was basically about trails throughout history from the first trails made by tiny organisms that are fossilized, I think up in Northern Canada or something to, you know, the roads and trails and streets, et cetera, of our daily lives. And while the book wasn't necessarily about the paranormal, it had a lot to say about how humans interact with the environment around us. And I can't recommend the book enough. It was really a lot of fun to read. If you are into hiking even a little bit, I think it's a book, great book to read, as well as if you're just interested in thinking about our environment in different ways. I also read a book called Dark Folklore by Mark Norman and Tracy Norman, which was published in 2021 and is basically what it says on the 10. It had a lot of really interesting folklore and thoughts about folklore. It definitely had a focus on folklore in the UK, and it was helpful in thinking about the folklore I'm looking at with regards to Fordham. And I also read a great book called The Vanishing Hitchhiker, American Urban Legends and Their Meanings by Jan Harold Brunvand, which was published in 1981 and which to me was the most difficult read out of this list of books because it is written in a much more academic and scholarly tone. The author is or was, I'm not actually sure if the author is still alive, a academic associated with the university, and it was really looking at popular American urban legends and some of the theories behind them and the ways that they spread and kind of how urban legends function in our society and what they do, etc. It was a really good book too. So I'll include this whole reading list on the show notes for this episode at barrysecretspodcast.com. And I think all of these were excellent books that have helped me think about all of these hauntings and strange things at Fordham, whether or not I've cited them directly. So with all of that out of the way, let's talk about some urban legends. So I want to start with a really interesting little exchange that I found in the March 25th, 1982 issue of The Ram, which is Fordham University's Bronx campus's student newspaper. There's an interview with an elderly Jesuit theology professor named Robert Gleason. And in the middle of this interview, kind of just thrown in, there's an interesting, seemingly random question. The interviewer asks this priest, what is this curse on Fordham that I've heard about? And the priest answers, that's a very old, long-lived Jesuit story. I heard it first 50 years ago and many times since. A strange curse is supposed to lie on the land. Why, I wonder. Of course, much more interesting, we have a Jesuit ghost, they tell me, who roams and moans at night. My advice, better get home early. So basically this Jesuit priest just jokes about it, but it's so interesting to me that as early as the 1930s, right? Like 50 years before 1982, this priest has had heard urban legends about a curse or a haunting on Fordham's campus. And to, to me, this really stands out for several reasons. One, this is the only thing I believe that I've been able to find in writing that claims that urban legends or stories about hauntings on Fordham's campus were circulating prior to 1970. I've mentioned this a couple times in this series, but mostly I've just seen things written in the student newspaper from 1970 and beyond. And trust me, I went through many, many pages of student newspapers from the early 20th century, desperately looking for any mention of ghost or spirit. And I just found mentions of, you know, 
the mass of the Holy Ghost or whatever. You know, there wasn't anything about paranormal events. And I also think this is really notable because the interviewee, Robert Gleason, this Jesuit, directly says, oh, this story came from the Jesuits. It's a long-lived Jesuit story. And I've mentioned this before. Jesuits live on Fordham's campus. They're a really integral part of the university's residential experience, I guess. You know, like both students and some Jesuits live on campus. It's a a Jesuit school, etc. So it's interesting that there's kind of this cross-pollination of urban legends and interesting to consider that it potentially came from the Jesuits initially. You know, this is just one person saying it, but that does give some additional context to why so many of the hauntings, perhaps, are about Jesuit priests or feature Jesuit priests approaching a student and having a conversation. And of course, the priest ends up being a ghost, etc. So it's interesting that long-term residents of the university, at least as of the 1980s, you know, the Jesuits who have this long kind of institutional memory were helping to spread some of these ideas of a Fordham curse or hauntings and Jesuit ghosts, etc. Now, to me, there's a big reason why a college in general, not even necessarily Fordham itself, but any college would have more stories about hauntings. And that's because I think that universities, especially residential ones, where there's a large part of the student population living on campus, I think that sort of university setting is a perfect petri dish for urban legend creation and proliferation, and here's why. So in a college with dorms, a bunch of people who all presumably know each other or are likely to interact are all living in close proximity, partying together, taking classes together, etc. Let's contrast that with a regular person, not a university student, living in an apartment or a house where the only thing that you and your neighbors share for certain is geographic proximity. You may not be the same age, you may not run in the same social circles, etc. So you might know your neighbors or you might not. And unless your neighborhood has a lot of block parties, you probably don't spend large amounts of time partying with, hanging out, and talking to your neighbors, swapping stories, etc. So for example, I've talked before in the podcast about some of the unusual paranormal activity in my current apartment here in Queens, but I've never talked to my neighbors about it. Usually when I see my neighbors, I just say hi, maybe we quickly talk about the weather, etc. But we're certainly not hanging out, swapping strange stories. Contrast that with a university, where not only is there already a shared trait between all students, the fact that they're all students at that university, but there are also socially acceptable reasons why you might be hanging out more with your classmates, maybe getting drunk and telling wild stories, etc. Also, while of course somewhere like Fordham has you know, some institutional memory in the form of Jesuits who might spend a long time living on campus. In general, undergraduates usually only spend about four years living on campus and then they move away. So I think that that makes it easier to spread weird, unlikely urban legends. So say that today, here in Queens, one of my neighbors told me that another neighbor who'd been living in the building for a couple decades had a weird paranormal experience six years ago. If I wanted to, I would be able to ask that other neighbor about it and hear the story firsthand. And even if I didn't choose to do that, my neighbor still might be less inclined to exaggerate the story for effect because they'd know that if I wanted to, I could just check with the original source because they're still in the building, they've been here for years, etc. Contrast that with a university where people usually only live in dorms for about nine months at a time and you know, if they're lucky and things go well, they don't spend more than four years in college as an undergraduate, which is typically when you might be living on campus. So it would be easy for an upperclassman to tell a freshman a weird story, and then for the story to get passed down from class to class. By the time this freshman is an upperclassman themselves and is telling someone else this weird story, 
the original storyteller would be long gone. So it's not like anyone's going to ask that person about it. Also, there are lots of parties where people are gossiping, spreading urban legends, etc. So that gives things a chance to spread far and wide and to possibly get embroidered, enhanced, made a little bit more dramatic with each retelling. So to me, a college is the perfect breeding ground for urban legends. Now, to be clear, this isn't to say that I think that all the stories of Fordham hauntings are urban legends. It's just that I think urban legends are far more likely to form in a residential college, you know, university setting. There's a great explanation about what urban legends do in the book I mentioned earlier, The Vanishing Hitchhiker, American Urban Legends and Their Meanings by Jan Harold Brunvand. So I wanted to read this explanation. In common with age old folk legends about lost mines, buried treasure, omens, ghosts, and Robin Hood-like outlaw heroes, urban legends are told seriously, circulate largely by word of mouth, are generally anonymous, and vary constantly in particular details from one telling to another, while always preserving a central core of traditional elements or motifs. Like traditional folklore, the stories do tell one kind of truth. They are a unique, unselfconscious reflection of major concerns of individuals in the societies in which the legends circulate. So at Fordham, there are a number of stories about people encountering ghostly priests, especially while studying. So in theory, the urban legends about Fordham could be related to it being a Catholic university and also to students being anxious about doing well in school, especially since some priests there are professors. And, you know, if we're considering that perhaps priests who live on campus are also sharing some of these legends, who knows, maybe there could be anxiety about the impact you leave on the world and being remembered after your death, etc. You know, there are, of course, other concerns that individuals may have that I'm not thinking of. These are just the most obvious ones that came immediately to mind to me as possible sort of functions urban legends might be serving on campus. Also, I mentioned this in prior episodes, and I mentioned it earlier in this one, but stories about Fordham hauntings only really appeared in print starting in the 1970s, and there are several reasons for that, I think. The first is, parts of The Exorcist were filmed on campus in the early 1970s. That added both a creepiness factor to campus, since The Exorcist was such a defining cultural product, And it also served as a reminder that the Catholic Church still performs exorcisms. In addition to that, there's a much more practical reason, which is that the number of students living on campus increased steadily, starting in the 1970s or so. Fordham became less and less of a commuter school as more students moved onto campus. So that meant that people had more time on campus to either witness hauntings or swap scary stories late at night, etc., And of course, it meant that they were on campus all night. And I think that most paranormal experiences or kind of creepy events would probably happen at night, or at least people would think they would happen at night. So they'd be more on the lookout for them. And then the third factor is that the satanic panic in the 1980s clearly influenced campus urban legends. For example, in the episode I did about Hughes Hall, there were stories of, quote, cultish paintings in the 1980s. And even the article I read from earlier in this episode mentioned a curse that Fordham supposedly had, which feels very horror movie, 1980s, etc. So throughout this entire series, I've had this concern kind of hovering in the back of my head. And I don't think I've voiced it yet, but I will do so now. I've been asking myself whether perhaps any university would have the same number of paranormal stories that Fordham has. I've been curious about whether I just think Fordham is more haunted because I went there and whether this is a form of bias where, you know, I decided to do a deep dive into something and of course found paranormal stories, but maybe I would find them at any university. So 
While I didn't have time to do a truly deep dive into a bunch of other universities, I did try to take a bit of a look at some other similar colleges, just to see what sort of conclusions I could potentially draw from that. So first, I wanted to think about New York private schools that had a large amount of students who live in student housing. So, you know, residential schools, not commuter schools. So to me, at least, the most obvious school to look at first is NYU, you know, New York University, because I've been arguing that Fordham is the location of the most highly concentrated hauntings in all of New York City. So the most hauntings in the smallest amount of land. But you'll notice that I haven't been arguing that it's the most haunted college in New York City. That's because I really don't know whether it could hold a candle to NYU, which is a much larger and better known school downtown in the village. Probably NYU needs no introduction. It's larger in both student population and geographically, so it has that edge on Fordham, right? There's more people to observe paranormal phenomena, there's more space in which to do it, and also, and possibly most importantly, the village is just an infamously haunted part of New York City. Oh, and for non-New Yorkers, the village is Greenwich Village. But everyone here just calls it the village. So without looking very hard, I found very easily 17 different articles or websites talking about some of NYU's hauntings. And that's just what I found at first blush doing an initial dive into this, but not any kind of deep dive. And the large number of NYU's hauntings doesn't surprise me even a little bit, though I would argue probably that NYU is haunted because it's in such a famously haunted neighborhood. To me, I don't really see how it could not be haunted. But to me, looking at NYU didn't give me any particular insight on Fordham's hauntings and causes behind Fordham's hauntings and urban legends, etc., because it just feels like a given that NYU would be haunted. And I was mostly Googling it to make sure I hadn't mistakenly assumed that it would have a huge number of stories of hauntings about it. But I think that really is just due to its location. Or if not, I don't know how I would separate out the effect that being in an extremely haunted place might have on the university's hauntings. So that's NYU. Next up, let's look at Columbia University, and here's where it gets a little bit more interesting to me. So I was very curious to see what hauntings Columbia University had since Ghostbusters was partially filmed there. Like NYU, Columbia is a very famous university, but for anyone who's not familiar with it, it is an Ivy League school in New York City in Morningside Heights. So that's an area kind of on the border between the Upper West Side and Harlem. And I spent a little bit of time on and around Columbia's campus. There is a really cool cathedral nearby that has some really creepy vibes to me. The whole area feels to me like it should be haunted, but for whatever reason, there just wasn't much for me to find, at least in, you know, the level of research that I did for this episode. I was disappointed because while there is one story about a ghost in a philosophy building that was interesting, there just wasn't anything close to the level of stories that I could find about Fordham or NYU. I did find this story on the website Her Campus that I wanted to read a bit from. During World War II, the United States launched the Manhattan Project to secretly develop a nuclear weapon. The project mainly took place at Columbia, where researchers, students, and physicists worked on creating these atomic bombs. Legend has it that one of the students working on the project was exposed to radioactive material and fatally poisoned. Students say that he haunts the tunnels below campus, which are remnants from the asylum. Supposedly, desperate physics students go looking for him, hoping he can help them with their exams. So a couple things here. One, the fact that the Manhattan Project mostly happened at Columbia, like that to me just, it's just bizarre to me that there's not more hauntings tied to that because that's a pretty heavy thing to have happened on Columbia's campus. I do think it's interesting that there's the bit about students looking for this 
ghost so that he can help them with their exams. That has some similarities to urban legends about Fordham's campus. I was really just shocked to find so few hauntings and legends about Columbia's campus, since to me, Columbia has some major similarities to Fordham, aside from being a very expensive private school in New York City. Also, you know, it was a filming location for an iconic paranormal-related movie, Ghostbusters, and it was literally built on the former site of the Bloomingdale Insane Asylum. The main library building on Columbia's campus was built on the site of the original insane asylum, which could house up to 200 people. This was a major asylum. And I'm not going to get super into its history now, but just that little thing should have sprouted a bunch of urban legends. And I don't know, you might say, oh, it's an Ivy League school. Maybe students are a bit more serious than like the artsy kids at NYU and the very Catholic student population of Fordham University. So just as a gut check and to get a little bit of anecdotal information, I asked a Columbia student. So my wife went to grad school at Columbia and she lived right off campus and she had a work study job at one of the libraries while it was being renovated. So she spent a lot of time alone in this library during the renovation and you know, there's so many stories of library hauntings in general, and renovations supposedly kick up hauntings. And despite being very sensitive to paranormal things, much more sensitive than I am, my wife said she never experienced anything weird or got any weird vibes or heard other people talk about ghosts, hauntings, or urban legends on campus. And again, this is purely anecdotal, and I do think the experience of a grad student even one living just off campus, is going to be different from the experience of an undergrad. So maybe if she had gone there for her undergrad, she'd feel differently. But it doesn't really seem that way based on the other things I've seen online. So that's Columbia. Next up, I wanted to talk about Vassar, which is a college in upstate New York in Poughkeepsie, which is, you know, maybe an hour and a half by train from New York City. And I ended up looking at Vassar in part because my wife went to Vassar and she said that it did have a creepy vibe at times when she was an undergrad there. So I did a little bit of digging and Vassar definitely has way more stories of hauntings than Columbia does. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that Vassar is way smaller than Fordham, Columbia, or NYU. Just the student population is much, much lower, which means that, you know, the hauntings per capita felt closer to a place like Fordham. So like Fordham, Vassar has a page on its website on Vassar.edu all about myths and legends at Vassar. And it talks about how in several buildings, Main fifth floor, main third floor, Pratt House, Alumni House, Davidson fifth floor, and Old Observatory, there were supposed hauntings. Oh, and this description does have a brief mention of suicide. So to read from that, many people have reported feelings of a presence watching them in these places. According to legend, Maine is the refuge of the spirits of suicidal students and deceased employees. Pratt House is inhabited by a ghost who is friendly to Vassar folk, but often disturbs those not officially affiliated with the college. I just loved that detail. This, you know, sometimes friendly ghost. I also found this great 2014 article in the Miscellany News, which is Vassar student newspaper, which has, you know, that's the best newspaper title I've ever heard. Anyway, the newspaper tells stories of ghostly maids people's spirits hanging out after dying, ghostly Victorian women, the ghost of Matthew Vassar, who died while giving a speech to the board, phantom footsteps, people feeling invisible hands touching them, hearing voices, etc. A lot of these sound a lot like some of the Fordham legends, right? And Emeritus Dean was quoted saying, a now rather famous performance artist in the class of 81 supposedly governed a coven somewhere in the South Tower of Maine. And he also said that another time 
He was, quote, called into the basement where some wallboard had been removed to determine if graffiti there were satanic markings. Our inexpert conclusion was that there weren't. So the graffiti thing and the satanic thing is so interesting to me because it makes me think of the Fordham story, you know, with the cultish wall paintings at Hughes Hall. And also to me, it gives some credence to this idea that like, whether it was somewhere like Fordham where people were scared of satanic panic type things in the 80s or somewhere like Vassar, which is very much the opposite in a lot of ways, where, you know, maybe someone's doing a coven sort of thing as maybe performance art, maybe not. You know, either way, this stuff is in the zeitgeist and may or may not be linked to hauntings, but definitely are linked to urban legends. Oh, and one side note about Vassar, if you've listened to my episode about the Renwick Smallpox Hospital, which is really it's the first two episodes of the podcast, you'll be interested to know that Vassar's main building was designed by James Renwick Jr. of Renwick Smallpox Hospital fame. So interesting connection between, you know, some creepy places. So to get back to hauntings and urban legends at Vassar, I found additional articles about hauntings at Vassar. There was a 2017 article that kind of repeated some of the other legends I've already mentioned. And there are definitely other stories of Vassar legends that I'm not mentioning here, since this episode is getting a little bit long already. But to get back to my main question here with this episode, I've been thinking about parallels between Vassar and Fordham and trying to see why they might both be pretty haunted. As I alluded to earlier, you almost couldn't find schools that are more opposite of each other. To me, they're almost in verses or maybe like a reflection in a mirror of each other, as far as I can tell. Because sure, they're both extremely overpriced private schools in New York State. But Vassar is, I'd say, suburban in its upstate, whereas Fordham is urban and downstate. Vassar is famous for its, uh, I guess you'd say liberalism, politically, culturally, sexually, etc. And Fordham is, in my opinion, extremely conservative and repressed. Vassar started out as a women's college, though it's open to all genders now. And of course, Fordham started as a college just for men. I will say I was curious if other women's colleges had a lot of hauntings. And I did just check out one other one. I didn't go through all of the Seven Sisters. But I looked at Smith College, which is a women's college that shows up on a lot of most haunted school lists. And Smith does seem to have a lot of stories of hauntings, which, you know, feels notable to me. So like I said, I haven't done a truly deep dive into looking at these other schools. But what this says to me, and you know, my impression coming out of thinking about all of this is that while schools like NYU might be haunted because of their location, I believe that some other colleges are haunted because of their students, like because of the people who choose to go there. This may sound tenuous, but hear me out. So Fordham is a Catholic school. The Catholic church is famous for a lot of beliefs that some people might consider paranormal. I'm talking about exorcisms, ghosts, demons, etc. As someone who was raised in the Catholic church, I can say with great confidence that it really felt paranormal to me when I was growing up and going to mass every week. So I would argue that Catholicism already has a lot of baked in paranormal imagery and beliefs. On the other hand, Vassar is a women's school that was founded in the 19th century. And women have historically been linked to spiritualism, seances, mediumistic talents, witchcraft, etc. And spiritualism did start in upstate New York in the 19th century, though I looked it up and the place where the Fox sisters lived is very far away from where Vassar is. I had no idea New York State was that large. But at any rate, this connection is interesting to me. And I have no idea whether there are any solid or even weak links between Vassar students and spiritualism, you know, 19th century Vassar students and spiritualism in the 19th century. So I'm not trying to make any solid assertions there. I would need to do a lot of further research in order to feel confident saying that. But 
I am saying that there's a historic link between women and the paranormal, just like there's a historic link between the Catholic Church and the paranormal. And I wonder if there's something in that. Because it doesn't matter how many ghosts and hauntings a school has, if the people who go there refuse to acknowledge the existence of the paranormal, there won't be paranormal stories coming out of that school. You know, you'll always be able to think of a reasonable explanation for something versus if you're someone who's primed to think about the paranormal, then whether or not you're experiencing paranormal phenomena, urban legends and ghost stories kind of arise naturally. And, you know, of course, I, I do think that actual paranormal things have happened on both Fordham's campus and Vassar's campus, but... You see what I mean about the different attitudes of people in a location and how that affects stories of hauntings, right? Also, importantly, both schools have a population of students who live on campus, you know, a large number of students. And so this, this may be me really grasping at straws, trying to like make my argument work. So feel free to just disregard this. But one thing that I was thinking about that I'm curious if there's a connection with is it is interesting to me that Fordham's stories of the paranormal began in the 1970s because Fordham became co-ed in 1974. There was a women's college that was associated with Fordham called Thomas More College that was around for about a decade before that. But at any rate, Fordham's paranormal stories do sort of dovetail with the arrival of women on campus as, you know, full Fordham students, not Thomas More College students. This to me, I feel like is probably correlation, not causation. And I am very wary of doing too much weird gender stuff here, right? Like I don't want to say that like women automatically have more access to the paranormal or, or anything like that. Like I'm really not comfortable with that statement. And it could be something else that Vassar students possess, whether it's an open mind or a certain level of creativity or interest in history, etc., that might be the thing that is making students more likely to believe in the paranormal. And, you know, I will say at Fordham, many, many of the paranormal stories happened to men, especially the earlier ones that I found, you know, in the 70s and 80s, and more things started to happen to women later in like the 90s and the 2000s. But whatever the reason, I do feel like something about the type of person who decides to go to Fordham or Vassar has a real impact on the types of stories and urban legends and potential hauntings that come out of both places. And if you have your own theories, I would love to hear them. Like maybe there's something really obvious I'm just missing, some obvious connection, etc. I'd love to hear your thoughts. So the last set of universities that I wanted to look at a little more quickly this time are other Catholic universities. Since, like I said, I think that Fordham's Jesuit, you know, Catholic identity has an influence on the hauntings. Since there's so many stories of ghostly priests and even more directly since it seems that at least as of the 80s, priests were helping to disseminate some of these urban legends. So first I looked at New York City Catholic schools. There are a couple of them. There may be others, but I just looked up the two that came to mind off the top of my head. There's St. John's University, which is now in Queens. It was founded in 1870. I searched haunted and ghost in their newspaper. And long story short, I didn't find anything about hauntings at St. John's. One important thing to note is that St. John's is more of a commuter school. So I'm sure that had an impact on that. Then I looked at St. Francis College in Brooklyn that was founded in 1859 by the Franciscans. And in a basic online search, I couldn't find any stories of hauntings at St. Francis. The site for the student newspaper, SFC Today, didn't seem to be live when I checked it on January 22nd. I tried, you know, multiple browsers, etc., and I couldn't find the archives of The Voice, which was the former student newspaper, online. But again, St. Francis is a bit more of a commuter school, so there's probably just less lore and fewer urban legends. Though I still have this feeling that like, if I could have found the archives of The Voice, there might have been something in there. Who knows? So then there are other Jesuit schools, and I did want to take 
bit of a closer look at Georgetown in DC, which is another exorcist filming location, Santa Clara in California, and Creighton in Nebraska. I did a little bit of research on them, but I did have to cut myself off. You know, the episode had to come out. I couldn't spend all of my time <laughs> reading about ghost stories at different universities. But I will say, from what I saw at Georgetown, the stories definitely sounded familiar. So on scarydc.com, which is a blog, there was a bit about that. So I just wanted to read a familiar sounding story. Two of the most popular Healy Hall legends reach back to the earliest days when Georgetown was a liberal arts college. According to one tale, a young Jesuit student accidentally opened the gates of the underworld when reading forbidden chants in a book about exorcism. A second tale involves another Jesuit who was crushed to death by the hands of the clock while working in the clock tower. Other Georgetown ghost stories tell of trapped spirits lost for eternity in the university's underground tunnel system. Man, when I read that, I was really like, okay, that sounds an awful lot like boredom, right? One, I just love the idea of opening the gates of the underworld. I don't even know what that's supposed to be, but that's delightful. And, you know, there's that tie to exorcism again, because, you know, the Catholic Church does dabble in some exorcism, and the exorcist was partially filmed on Georgetown's campus. And then, of course, there's the tunnel system thing as well, right? Just like Fordham, there's a creepy tunnel system, etc. And I will say, in the bit of digging I did about Santa Clara and Creighton, I don't know whether they could quite give Fordham a run for their money, but it did feel like there were significant stories of hauntings at those places. I very easily found a number of roundups of stories at those universities without even needing to dig into the university's newspaper archives. I just found stuff online because like Fordham, there's so many legends that the haunting and like haunted places aggregator type sites have glommed onto them and reprinted them, etc. Okay, so here we are. I'm done talking about urban legends and universities. And I see that I've been recording for not quite an hour, but close to an hour. So remember how I started this episode saying, there's just two more episodes left of the Fordham series, and then I'll be done. And it almost sounded like a promise when I said it, but I also doubted myself. Yeah, there's no way I'm getting to ley lines in this episode. I'm sorry, I went off script too many times. My careful word count to runtime calculations have been all for naught. So I guess the Fordham series is gonna be 12 question mark episodes. If I can, I'll try to slot the ley lines bit that I wanted to say into the rest of the things I wanted to talk about, about why places might be haunted and why Fordham specifically might be haunted. But let's be honest, you know me, there's definitely gonna be two more episodes about this topic. So anyway, next time I'm definitely gonna talk about ley lines. I'm gonna try to talk about window areas. I dug up a bunch of aeromagnetic maps. They were completely incomprehensible, but I looked at them. I'll report back to you what my thoughts are about the aeromagnetic maps and how they relate to window areas. <laughs> um, and we'll see how many topics I can fit into the next episode. I have a lot more to say on this subject because I do think the question of why might a place be haunted? What are some of the theories, etc. is just so fascinating. So thank you so much for going on this journey with me. I really appreciate the fact that I've been doing an extremely extended series that no one asked for about a college that is not very well known outside of the tri-state area. And I don't think that many Fordham students or alumni have found this series yet. Based on my metrics, I think that as of the publication of this episode, it is my usual listeners who have been listening to this. And I can just say, I know statistically that most of you did not go to Fordham and perhaps many of you didn't know that Fordham existed. So I just wanted to say how much I appreciate you listening to this and humoring me 
I'm gonna be honest, I figured the more episodes I did about Fordham, the more my listener numbers would go down from episode to episode. You know, like I expected a very low conversion rate or, you know, a normal conversion rate. And I can say that it seems like people who are starting to listen to the beginning of the series are continuing to listen to the later episodes in the series. And I know this is extremely long and I don't know if esoteric is the right word, but, you know, it's not the normal big name paranormal location. So I just really appreciate you listening to this. And with that, if any Fordham folks are listening to this, and if you did have anything strange happen to you while you were on campus, anything paranormal, or if you even like heard some fun urban legends, please tell me. I would love to hear your stories. You can write to me at buriedsecretspodcast at gmail.com. You can check out the show notes for this episode, which will also include the script for this episode and, you know, the list of books I referenced in this episode at buriedsecretspodcast.com. You can follow me on Instagram at buriedsecretspodcast. If you liked this episode, please tell your friends about it. Please rate and review. That really helps people find out about the podcast. And thanks so much for listening.